May what I say and what you hear be in the name of God. Amen. Uh, let me just say parenthetically that the Revised Com Common Lectionary has two tracks, and I'm really regretting <laughs> picking track one. Um, the, the, the lessons today in particular are so disparate that uh, there's just no way for me, I couldn't figure out a way to reconcile them and sort of unify them into some coherent package that could be a sermon. Uh, do I preach on the Old Testament? Do I preach on the Gospel? Do I preach on, on Hebrews? And uh, actually, I did preach on divorce. Uh, I preached on it from my perspective as a divorced priest. priest. And it was in 2012, and it's on YouTube. It's on our YouTube channel. If you just go to YouTube and you type in, I'm a priest and I'm divorced, I did this this morning. I come up, it's number two, right after a horror movie. <laughs> so uh, that, act, that sermon's actually more about sin in general, but uh, I do talk about divorce from, from my perspective. So you can go see that. So I've decided to talk about, preach on Hebrews, the, the letter to the Hebrews. The author is uh, debatable. Scholars, some scholars fall on, it was, it's from Paul, others say no. Written about 60 AD, 30 so years after the death and resurrection of Jesus. For convenience, I'm gonna refer to the author as Paul. Uh, I'm gonna sort of opt that way. But let me, let me start this way, because th this, this part of Hebrews sets up the whole rest of the letter. And the thrust of the argument is that Jesus, because Jesus is God and human, Jesus can be our great high priest. Now, that's all very Jewish language because it's written to the Hebrews. Okay, so it's very Jewish language. Let me bring it into the sort of here and now. I think what, how I would translate that today, I would say, because Jesus is God and human, Jesus is my personal Lord and Savior. And Jesus is my personal Lord and Savior. When I say that, I'm not sure what you hear. I can tell you that I don't mean the emphasis to be my, as in it's all about me. I mean that I know a person whose name is Jesus, that I, I came to know this person. Uh, God, it, 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 at a time in my teenage years, this is, this is when it really sort of hit me through prayer and laying on of hands that God was no longer a concept, God was no longer an idea, God wasn't a, an all-powerful, distant creator who demanded or even deserved my worship. Through prayer and laying on of hands, I felt the presence of a person. The writer of Hebrews would say that he, he felt the glory of the Lord. I'll come back to that. Now, as an adult, as, an, as a priest in particular, uh, this is not so true lately, but for the first few decades of my ordained ministry, I found myself challenged by the language coming out from clergy that the way they talked about God, the way they talked about Christ, so depersonalized it that it, it really challenged me. So they weren't challenging me directly, but it was, in, it was indirect. And I understand I understood and I understand a lot of why there was a push to sort of depersonalize the whole thing and talk about the Christ, uh, don't use the word Lord, uh, don't really talk about the Son too much. And, and it's all because of women's ordination. Women struggled for so long to be recognized as equal, equally capable and worthy of being called to ordain ministry. And uh, I, get, I get that. 
But I couldn't reconcile the, the impersonal language because I, don't, I couldn't know, for example, I, I can't know the Redeemer. I know Jesus who redeemed me. But to just talk about him as the Redeemer just struck me as something that it, it, I was no longer talking to a person. Now, Shifting gears a little bit, so Jesus is my personal Lord and Savior because Jesus is a person. And a person is a human being. So I'm going to let that sink in a little bit because that should blow your mind, but that does get at the very heart of Trinitarian theology. In the Old Testament, And I did this this morning. I did a search of the NIV in my pocket Bible, in my my iPhone. I searched for no God. There is one occurrence of no God in the book of Job. And it goes like this. The dwelling of an evil man is the place of one who does not know God. So the context is really not, here's how to know God, or we can know God. It's, it's still very impersonal. I also looked up knowledge of God. There is one occurrence in the Old Testament of the phrase, knowledge of God. And it's in Proverbs, chapter 2, verses 3 and 5. In D, three through five. Indeed, if you call out for insight and cry aloud for understanding, skipping a little bit, then you will understand the fear of the Lord and find the knowledge of God. The context, though, is really find God's knowledge. Right? It's, it's not knowing God. It's about knowledge itself as coming from God. So the the idea of of knowing God at some personal level is really foreign to the Old Testament. But that changes in a big way in the New Testament. The incarnation changed all of that. In the Gospel of John, in chapter 17, Jesus In Jesus' prayer to the Father, at one point he says, Now this is eternal life, that they may know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ whom you have sent. And Paul in Ephesians 4, writing about the, the leaders of the church whose purpose is to build up the body of Christ in the unity of faith and knowledge of the Son of God. And if that sounds just a little bit impersonal, Paul brings it strikingly home in Philippians chapter 3, verses 8 through 10. I consider everything a loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord. Yes, I want to know Christ. The New Testament presents a whole new worldview from the Old Testament. It is now possible to know God through the Son, through Jesus, because we're talking now about a person. Jesus is fully God and fully human, and because of this, humans can know God and be known by Jesus. And this understanding is absolutely vital to the writer of Hebrews. If Jesus does not rule creation as the Lord and true human being from heaven, then he cannot be our great high priest. Or to put it another way, he cannot be our personal Lord and Savior. So in Jewish language, this is the argument that the writer of Hebrews is making. And it's not so much an argument, it's not like this is, he's not writing like St. Augustine, (laughs) 
or the early church fathers trying to explain how it is that Jesus could be God and human being. It's just, here it is, but it's now in very, very Jewish language. If you're going to write something to the Jews, you're going to preach a sermon or whatever to Jewish Christians, you want to convince them that Jesus is superior to the Torah, probably the first place to start is to make sure they understand that Jesus is the creator God. Because there's only one God. You shall worship the Lord your God and no other, right? Worship him alone. They're surrounded by pagan religions that had many, many gods. The Jews were the odd people out. They were the weird ones. Look, those people only believe in one God. How stupid is that? I mean, that's the world that they lived in. So you want to come right out of the starting gate. Jesus is the creator God. And that's what the writer does. Verse 2, in these last days, God has spoken to us by a son through whom he also made the universe. And all kinds of echoes there from the Gospel of John, the word through whom all things were made, 1 Corinthians 8, uh, Colossians chapter 1, all emphasizing again and again that Jesus is the one through whom God has created all that is. And then comes this interesting phrase that Jesus reflects the glory of God. Jesus reflects the glory of God. In Exodus 33, 18, Moses asks God if he can see his glory. Show me your glory. The answer is really revealing and in terms of the getting at the meaning of glory. God responds, well, I will let my goodness pass in front of you, but you cannot see my face because anyone who sees my face will die. That is, I'll show you my goodness, but you cannot see me. Which I find is interesting. You ask, can I see your glory? And God responds, well, no. Because that would mean you would see me. And you can't do that. So my point is that to see the glory of God, truly see the glory of God, is to see God face to face. And what does the writer of Hebrews say? We see Jesus. This reflection of God's glory. We see the true God in Jesus Christ. He is the one who's finally made it possible to look into the face of God. And then comes a point that sounds like he's still arguing that Jesus is God, but he's actually trying to make the argument that Jesus is the true human being. He wrote that in Jesus we see the exact imprint of God's very being. Is there anyone here still old enough to have actually typed on a real typewriter? Okay. All right. So when you typed on a real typewriter, you know, the, the kids were like, what? I don't know. What's that? You talk about the characters hitting the page, the paper. So the Greek word for imprint that here is the perfect imprint of God's very being, the Greek word there is the word from which we get the word character, as in the character of a play or character of, in the alphabet. It was actually a, a word used to describe the process of making a coin, and in that era, Roman coins were stamped with the image of the emperor who was God, which makes the coin the image of God. Okay, so the image of God is, that's, there's the image of God. Now, in our, when we talk about the image of God, who are we talking about? We're talking about people. If you go looking in the, in the Book of Common Prayer, 
Which you can do, by the way. You can go online to the online version and do a search. Image. Image of God. There's only one reference to, well, actually it's a reference to another human being. Jesus is the image of God. But the rest of the occurrences, like 16 of them, are all about human beings. We are the image of God. So to say that Jesus, in him, we see the perfect imprint of the very being of God, that is a oblique way of saying Jesus is the true image of God. In him, that image is not marred by sin. In us, it's marred. It's deeply distorted. But in Jesus, we see it perfectly and completely. That is not an argument for him being God. It's an argument for him being the human being that we were all intended to be. And it reaches this culmination at the end of this section of chapter 2 where the writer is saying, and because of all of this, Jesus is our great high priest, our personal Lord and Savior. So unlike, unlike earthly high priests in Jesus' day, in that day, Jesus did more than represent God. Jesus was God. And unlike the human priests of the day, flawed, sinful human beings that they were, who could only enter the Holy of Holies once a year on the Day of Atonement, Jesus is the true human being who suffered and therefore knows firsthand what it means to be like in the real world and is able to be in the Holy of Holies forever and ever to be our mediator. This last section of, of Hebrews chapter 2, verses 16 and 18, let me read to you quickly N.T. Wright's translation. It's obvious, you see, that God isn't taking special thought for angels. He's taking special thought for Abraham's family. That's why God had to be like his brothers and sisters in every way so that he might become a merciful and trustworthy high priest in God's presence to make atonement for the sins of the people. He himself suffered, you see, through being put to the test, and that's why he is able to help those who are being tested right now. And ever since the first arguments were made that Jesus is both God and human being, humans have tried to get out from under it. Well, he's really only God and he's not human. Or he's human, but he's, you know, he's not human, he's only God. Or he's not God, he's only human. Or he's some sort of, you know, hybrid of all of that. Let's try to get out from under the fact that God has done something so extraordinary. I mean, in, even to this day, other world religions, not Judaism per se, but I, I will say of Islam, one of the things about Islam, and this is not, I'm not trying to knock Islam in any way, but God does not become human. No. God is above all of that. God is the great God who, who, who could not become part of creation. That's anathema. Well, that's not a new problem. That was the kind of problem that pagans had. Wait a minute. The gods don't mess around with this yucky material world. I mean, the spiritual is far superior to the material. And what the whole argument is saying is that if Jesus is fully God and fully human, Jesus has taken the material into the spiritual realm, and the two are together. But the real problem is that as, as soon as you admit that Jesus is fully God and fully human, a person, then you're stuck with an individual who is not you, is not you, is other than you, separate from you, in fact, the one who created you, and yet is the one who knows you and the one you can now know 
Because you can't know a concept, but you can know a person, our great high priest. Amen.